<clears throat> Amen. Praise God. Let's turn in our Bibles to the, the book of Romans, the great epistle of the Apostle Paul. We want to look carefully for the next couple months, maybe further than that, at chapters 6 through 8. As you're turning there, I just want to give you kind of an outline of Romans, a simple one. But if I could summarize it well, Romans 1 through 5 is, could be labeled Christ's justification. Chapters 6 through 8 are sanctification. That's what we'll be studying. Chapters 9 through 11, the restoration of Israel. And then chapters 12 through 16, the practical implications of our justification and our sanctification. Let's now turn to Romans 6. I want to read the first section dealing with our union with Christ in his life and his death and resurrection. Romans 1, 6, 1 to 14. This is God's holy word. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal body to make you obey its lusts or passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under the law but under grace. Let's pray. Lord, we are humbled by these words I've just read. You've told us how we are to consider ourselves dead to sin and alive to God. Because sin shall have no more dominion over us. We've been brought from death to life. And Lord, we thank you that your resurrection life is our life. That is the life of we who have repented and believed the gospel and who have been born again and whom you live in and through to the glory of your name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. In the year 1841, the Congregationalist minister and historian from Vermont, Joseph Tracy, wrote the following words about the Great Awakening of 1740 in his book, The Great Awakening. If you don't have that book, it's now available in paperback 
Uh, it was written near the end of the, of the 19th century, or actually the 18th century, um, and it's a worthy read. He said this in the beginning of that book. He said, the immediate occasion of commencement, that is, of the Great Awakening, was begun by a series of sermons preached by Jonathan Edwards of Northampton, Massachusetts. In fact, last year on my sabbatical, I, I went to that town with my wife and went to that, well, the place where it was, the only thing remaining of that church where this awakening began are the three front door steps. So I stepped on those steps and I said, Lord, help me. I have a measure of Edwards here. It was a series of sermons by Edwards on the doctrine of justification by faith alone. And Tracy goes on, he says, and among the most efficient means of carrying it on were his sermons, which proved that every mouth must be stopped and shall be on the day of judgment. He's referring to Romans 3 in verse 19, where Edwards preached this one particular sermon as it launched off into the awakening. He sa it says by Paul in verse 19, Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world will be held accountable to God. Now just think about the sobriety of that statement. Every mouth shall be stopped. That means you. That means me. Every mouth. There'll be no explanations on the day of judgment. There'll be no excuses made. Every mouth stopped and made accountable to God on the day of judgment. Your only hope is to be made right with God. I was talking to someone the other day about, you know, the difference really between Roman Catholicism and what we believe in this church. And I said it could be summarized very simply by asking one question. And the question is this. How can a sinner be made right with God? And my only, here's my answer for someone who's received Christ. The only way I could be right with God is to receive his righteousness and for him to take all of my unrighteousness and place it upon himself. That's it. The Catholic Church at the rough time of the Reformation said, well, no, you, and you can, you can test it. You could ask anybody who's a Catholic. And I say this because my heart breaks because I'm from that background, for those who didn't know it. But the gospel that they understand is believe and do your best to be as good as you can be. That's it. By being good enough or borrowing enough good works from the treasury of merit that the Vatican allows you to borrow, that you'll, hopefully you'll have enough works that will enable you to get right with God. That's not the Bible. That's not Christianity. And that will lead you to hell on the day of judgment. But you know what? There's people that aren't Roman Catholic who grow up in churches like ours and who somehow, some way feel at the end of the day there's going to be enough good things you've done and enough prayers offered and enough Bible memorizing and enough of whatever you may count as important and religiously valuable that still are confused and don't understand that it's none of that that saves you. What saves you is seeing your sin, seeing Christ is the only sin bearer for your sin to be right with the living God. 
Because on the day of judgment, every mouth will be stopped and every man will be brought to accountability to God. Are you ready for the day of judgment? Are you? I am. And the only reason why I am is because Christ, as I repented, by, which was a gift from him, I believed the gospel, which was a gift from him, my only hope, my only resting place is this, is that he heard my cry, which he produced, and caused me to call upon him, and I received the forgiveness of all of my sins, past, present, and future, and I was given the righteousness that he was required on the day of judgment. And now, by grace and by his mercy, if I die in the next moment or live for another 50 years, it doesn't matter. I'm right with God. Are you? Young person, little, little kid, I'm talking to you. Five-year-old, eight-year-old, 10-year-old. I'm talking to older people here that have been in church their whole lives. Are you right with God? Are you trusting in Christ alone as your only hope? That's what I want us to see. Because if so, you're made holy by him at salvation, righteous, and therefore, how could we who died to sin, says Paul, still live in it. We don't live that way. We live different lives. If any man's in Christ, he's a new creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Don't think that somehow, some way, you'll escape the day of judgment. Edwards said, every mouth shall be stopped on the day of judgment. This is, this is good conversation to have with your families. Please do this regularly and talk about this. I hope this series causes everyone to start reading through Romans 6 through 8 over and over and over and discussing it carefully. I continue. Now, many other examples from church history besides Edwards I could bring out to bear on this whole recovery of sola fide or the doctrine of justification by faith alone, but you can mark it. It usually drifts into an uncertain message or a fuzzy message when pulpits cease to preach the whole counsel of God. And it's, a, it's a concern because when God is not glorified in the gospel, the good news, then churches fall asleep and need an awakening. In Romans 3.28, Paul goes on a few verses after 3.19, which I just read. He said this, For we maintain that a man is justified by faith, made right with God by faith, which is a gift, apart from the works of the law. Will you have works that defend you on the day of judgment? Yes. But the works are not what saves you. Remember this. The works demonstrate that something supernatural happened in your life. That's what he's saying. That's why it says in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, 4, and 10, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not as a result of works, lest anyone should boast. For we, who believe, are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. The works are the demonstration that something supernatural has happened in your life. They don't save you. Christ's imputed, credited righteousness saves you. And then a life that has died to sin and is alive in God is the evidence of a supernatural work. Now, in the first five chapters of Romans, I want to kind of break this down to set the stage and see how it brings us to chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. And the first thing I want us to see is in Romans 1, 1 to 17, we see that Christ's righteousness is revealed by sola fide or the justification by faith alone. 
It's the gospel. What is the gospel? Romans 1.16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it, the gospel, is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith because the just, righteous, the just shall live <clears throat> by faith. Are you living by faith? Which is a gift to everyone who turns from their sin and receives Christ. The just, the right, those who are right with God, sinners who become right with God, the just shall live, hold on and live by faith alone. Not by works. But their life will have plenty of works to demonstrate something supernatural has happened and great regenerating work of God. Secondly, I want us to see in <clears throat> the first five chapters of Romans, verses one, chapter one, verse 18, through chapter three, verse 20, I've entitled this little section here, The Righteousness of God Needed, Needed, By all the world, and I've already read that, but I'll say it again in Romans 3.19, for we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that, so that, purpose statement, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may become accountable to God. Verse 20, for by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight. Did you see that? For by the works of the law, no human being will be justified, declared not guilty on the day of judgment, declared righteous. No human being in, in his sight will be declared justified since through the law comes the knowledge of sin. When we see in Romans 7, the, the, well, really the, the heat of the warfare of believers fighting their own flesh and the world and the devil. When we talk in depth about how to war a good warfare there, when we see that, you will soon be, be a, amazed that the reality of the knowledge of sin becomes evident. Paul says in Romans 7, Verse 7 and following, he says, What then shall we say? That the law is sin? In other words, is the Bible sin? The holiness of God, the word of God, is that sin because it reveals sin in our life? No. By no means, he says. Yet, if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said you shall not covet. If the law had not said that, I wouldn't have known it. But through the preaching of the law, the word of God, what I'm doing right now, comes a knowledge, an accountable knowledge of your sin. I always was amazed. You know, here I was, I was never, I was not raised, uh, like I said, I was raised in a Roman Catholic home. I, I wasn't raised reading, going to the, little Bible clubs and memorizing scripture and vacation Bible school and Sunday schools. Uh, I wasn't raised with that. that I, I lost a lot. Of, it took me years to catch up with my Southern Baptist wife's knowledge of the Bible and all her little training she had growing up around the Bible in Louisiana. It took me years I, I, to get to where she could say, I, I finally now can talk to you about Old Testament stories and you actually know them. In my, I always was amazed because in my experience, I didn't take a seminar on, on a list of things that I couldn't continue in my life now that I was born again. And how, how was I able to apprehend when I wasn't going to certain classes to educate me. Okay, Jerry, you can't do this now since you're a Christian. You have to live this way. I didn't, I was just starting to hear teaching and preaching. I wasn't, 
even reading the Bible, I was reading the Psalms and Proverbs and not understanding it. I was a new believer. And what was it? It was God, the Holy Spirit, through the Word of God, speaking to me about my soul and the war I was now in. And it, in one sense, frightened me. In another sense, it made me smile because now I knew I was truly a Christian in the war. So Paul says, but verse 8, Romans 7, but sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness, for apart from the law, sin lies dead. But once the word comes, it awakens you to your wicked heart and shows you your only hope is the mercy of God. That's why you need biblical preaching regularly. That's why you need to be reading your Bible regularly. Not to save yourself, not to keep yourself saved, that's works, but to know God and know your soul. Calvin said in, his, in a great works on the Institutes of the Christian Religion, he said to know God is the most important thing and then to know yourself. You can't know yourself until you know God through the word of God. Thirdly, in summarizing the first five chapters of Romans, chapter 3, verse 21, to chapter 5, verse 21, we see the righteousness of God is provided by Jesus Christ alone. Matthew 1, 21, they shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. But our concern now, in chapter 6, is then to see that Christ's righteousness is demonstrated then in chapter 6 through 8 by our lives that are clearly sanctified. One of my favorite quotes, you may remember, I've probably shared it a couple times before, is by one of my interesting uh, favorites in church history. His na name was Leonard Ravenhill. I didn't agree with Leonard in a lot of doctrinal areas, but nothing heretical, but he was a, kind of a Keswick, which we'll, we'll learn what that word means, Keswick, as we go through our study about you know, deeper life and saying, how do we understand how to become holy and stay holy and all that. But anyway, he made this statement that I think is sound. He said, the greatest miracle God can do in this world is to take an unholy man out of an unholy world, make him holy, then put him back in an unholy world, and then keep him holy. That's an amazing thing. If you, if you were to, if I said right now, let's stop and let's encourage each other, I, I would ask you to start looking at each other and what you know. Some people in our church building here better than other people, but there are many people in this room that, that I, I just, I, I love their, their testimonies, their life and their commitment to Christ. Because I know God took an unholy man or woman out of an unholy world and put him, made him holy and put him back into this unholy world and keeps him holy. Only God can do that. Now, what is sanctification? Since that's the key title we're dealing with in chapter six through eight, here's a little definition. Sanctification is the process by which believers grow to maturity in Christ. It suffice to say this, that that to grow as a Christian, to experience Christian growth is ex should be expected. It should be necessary in your thinking, and it should be progressive, ongoing. Look, listen to some of these words that describe practical sanctification. Christ likeness, godliness, 
holiness, love increasingly, knowing God more deeply, and then, although imperfect this side of heaven, but guaranteed glorification with him at the end of history. Now, the, the growth and maturity are key. Go with me to Philippians 3 for a moment. Philippians 3. <clears throat> Philippians 3, verse 12. Look at Paul says, it's so helpful. He says, it's not that I have already obtained this. He says, or I'm already perfect, even though I'm an apostle. He says, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beautiful. He says, brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, I forget, I forget what lies behind and I strain forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And then look what he says in verse 15. Let those of us who are mature, did you catch that? Those, those of us who are mature think this way, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. So he's saying it's biblical and, and, and biblically noble to think in a mature way. Would you say you're growing as a Christian? Are you seeing God at work in your life? <clears throat> We're told in, in 1 Peter 2.2, 2, long for the pure milk of the word that by it you may grow in respect to your salvation. We're told that we should crave the word of God. And God, the primary way God uses uh, the means to bring us to maturity is through the word of God. In fact, if you're somewhat of a face, Facebook person and you've seen some of our services you might have also seen that we're posting uh, some little vignettes, 15, 20 minute devotionals I've been doing. I've done four about Psalm 119. And there's going to be 22 ultimately available. You might want to watch those, some of those, uh, as a family or a good homeschooling assignment. It's, it's again, it's talking at, about the Word of God and it's an impact in our life toward maturity from 22 different angles, eight verses each, all inspired by the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> so, we're also commanded in 2 Peter 3 to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> now, what helps us understand growth is this, that our sanctification, that is the process of making us mature, is really fundamentally has two aspects. One, it, <clears throat> it is a positional matter Secondly, it's a practical matter. I, I've just been talking about the practical, but let's back up for a minute and let's talk about the positional matter of holiness. Go with me to 1 Corinthians 6. 1 Corinthians 6. This can't get any clearer than this right here, about the positional aspect. So in other words, justification guarantees sanctification. Has everybody got that? Justification, declaring you not guilty, your sins forgiven, Christ's righteousness received, justification, right, is inseparable from sanctification, that is positional sanctification. We've been talking about practical sanctification, maturing, growing by, from one shade of glory to the other, but here we want to see what Paul is hitting on in 1 Corinthians 6. And I'll read verses 9 to 11. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? In other words, he's saying, mark it. The people I'm about to tell you about, these people, it doesn't matter what they say they believe in. If their lives are characterized by these sins, they will not end up in heaven. That's what he's saying. Do not be deceived, neither sexually immoral, if anybody doesn't understand that, parents, please explain that to your kids, the sexually immoral, idolaters, 
adulterers, men who practice homosexuality. I, I don't understand how people today say you can be a saved homosexual. I don't understand it. They're not reading their Bibles carefully. Can you be a, can you be a saved drug dealer? What do you think? Can you be a Christian drunk? Can you be a Christian gang member? What do you think? Can you be a Christian lesbian? Can you be a Christian who beats up old ladies because they don't agree with their ideology about politics? Nor are those who practice homosexuality, nor th can you be a Christian thief? Can you be a Christian ripoff, greedy? Christian drunk, can you be a Christian troublemaker, a reviler, a rioter? Can you be a Christian who is rioting and beating up people and burning down buildings and doing all these things, damaging public property and thinking you're right about, can you be a Christian reviler? I don't know, but look at the Bible. Nor a swindler, can you be a Christian ripoff? He just gives you a list that's not exhaustive. And look what he says in verse 11. And such were some of you. Isn't that wonderful? The church of Corinth was made up of people from this background. God saves sinners. He saves crazy people, violent people, immoral people. All kinds of people he saves. All who see their sin and repent, he forgives and gives them eternal life. Such were some of you, but watch now. You were washed. That's another way of saying Regeneration, Titus 3, 5. By the washing of regeneration, new life, and renewal by the Holy Spirit. But you were washed. You were, there it is, sanctified, set apart unto priestly service to God, to worship God. You were holy, made holy, and you pursue holiness because you're holy. Then look what he says. You were justified. You were declared not guilty. Do you realize this? If you're here this morning, if you've repented and believed the gospel, if you're a born-again Christian here, you're no longer guilty before God. The high court of heaven says not guilty declared you righteous. Look what it says. You were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. You don't live that way anymore. Why? You've been born again. You died to sin. We'll talk about that in just a moment. And when I read passages like this, Philippians 1, 6, He, God, who began the good work in you, conversion, that is, regeneration, sanctification, justification. He who began the good work in you will perfect you, mature you, sanctify you progressively until the day of Christ, until the day you see Christ's face. He's the author, he initiates the document, the author and perfecter of our faith. That's Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ has done this for us. And now, as a result, chapter 6 of Romans tells us that we're dead to sin. We're free from sin's tyranny. Chapter 7 is going to teach us that we're free from the law's condemnation. And then chapter 8 is going to teach us that we are alive in the Spirit because God himself dwells in you and I by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let 
Now, having said all that, let's look at verses 1 and 2. Instead of a good homiletical outline of three points, I've got two for you. Two. And in these two points, I want you to see, first of all, that sanctification, being made holy, sanctification is concerned with imputation. Remember? Imputation is, a, is another powerful word, and it means to credit one's account. It's a, a kind of an accounting term in the ancient documents, uh, secular documents around the time of Christ. It, it meant like to credit someone's account. So in other words, we have a debt we could never pay, right, our sin. So God sends his son, and he, what Christ does is he pays an unpayable debt, and he, he imputes to our account the full payment. So, sanctification, firstly then, in verse 1, speaks of imputation. And then, again, still by way of review and, and setting the stage, the second point then, verse 2, would be sanctification has to do with impartation. The impartation of new, maturing life. Holiness of life is what we're all about. Holiness shouldn't be a, what does that mean? It should be a term we should, well, well, how, what, what, why does he always talk about holiness? We, should, we shouldn't be confused about that. Because the pursuit of holiness, not to secure our salvation, has already been taken care of by Christ, but to pursue holiness is what normal Christians do. So look at verse 1 here then. Verse 1 says this. What shall we then say? Are we, to, are we to sin that grace may abound? See, what happens is people begin to say, when, Pastor Marcelino, when you start talking about it, and this is especially the Roman Catholics say this too. <clears throat> what, there's, what they say is this. If, if what you're saying is true, you repent and believe the gospel, and works have nothing to do with your salvation, well then, that's, that's going to give license to people to live ungodly lives because they'll just believe and then sin that grace may abound. So what cults do, Jehovah Witnesses, Mormons, and Catholics and so on, what they do is, is they say to ensure that there's none of this, just make a decision and repent and believe and then and, 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 and works are not required. You have to do all these things, lists of things, to keep yourself moving in the right direction. And somehow, some way, it might work out if you're a special person or have a special connection with all this. What's going to happen is through all of that, you're going to end up by hook or by crook somehow, maybe in heaven, but especially if you're a, someone who's in the clergy of their systems. See, they're all concerned because that's too easy, they say. Well, we're going to talk about that and unpack that in the next few moments because this is a crucial accusation that needs to be answered, and sadly, most of evangelicalism has been a bad testimony. Justification, then, in verse 1 here, then, guarantees our sanctification. It guarantees our positional sanctification and our practical sanctification. It guarantees the fact that we're going to work out our faith. In Romans chapter 5, look what Paul says in verses 20 and 21. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Again, again, this is the classic text that people will bring up and say, see, see, if I carried to the, to the right 
distance of what you're talking about, Pastor Marcelino, then what you're saying is this. You sinned, you repent to Jesus, you sin again, and oh goodness, I've done the same sin now three times this week, and I've told God I'm sorry every time. See, you really aren't sorry, they would say. And you're sinning because you have a cheap grace view. You just pray that prayer, and Jesus forgives you, and you hop along, and there you go again. And, say, and you're, over time, you're not really bothered by it. You're not shedding tears. Well, that's one way to look at it, if you have a work system of righteousness. But how about, I'll give you my, my profile this past week. My profile is uh, the more I grow as a Christian, the more I see of sin in my life. Now, no one else sees what, the level that I see, hopefully not. And I see it, and it grieves me. But then I look to the cross, and I go, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, because you keep showing me every day my sinful heart, that you forgave me, the dominion of sin has been broken, and now I see sin for what it is, and I repent to you afresh. And yes, I'm weary. Sometimes the battles rages, and sometimes it, I, I feel I have heightened experiences of, of weeks and months of, of great growth for an imperfect man, but then at the end of the day, I end up saying, Lord, I'm ready for heaven because you've made me ready. And I'm not escaping this world, but Lord, heaven looks more beautiful to me every day because I see that's my true home. And this fight is a fight to the end. Not for my salvation. It's a fight for holiness. It's a fight for obedience to glorify God. Not that if I somehow have a bad week in my Bible reading, my, my bad attitude or this or that, it crops up and I don't repent, I can still repent and see at the end of the day, my salvation has always been secure. But I'm not sinning that grace may abound. I'm simply discussing with you the reality of the clashing of flesh against spirit and the reality of the spiritual war we're in. And that's what Paul is talking about. He's talking about the real tensions about what it means to love your wife when your flesh doesn't desire to serve her or the kids. What do you do in thoughts like that when, when you should be the spiritual head of your home? How do you handle that? Well, a Christian man sees it as wicked and sinful, selfish, and repents, and then determines by the grace of God for strength to Go forward in the word of God, walking humbly before God to serve his family and love his wife as Christ loved the church. What he, what he, what he, what he wants us to see here then is this reality of the battle. Now look at the verse 1 says this. What shall we then say? Chapter 6. Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? He's dealing with verses 20 and 21 right on uh, of chapter 5, wanting us to see that there's, there's going to be this increasing, but it's not going to be, if I'm just going to sin that grace may abound. That's a false accusation. Remember in Galatia, Paul was talking to the Judaizers. They were false teachers. They said, yes, you have to believe in Jesus, but also get circumcised. Yes, believe in Jesus, but also get circumcised. That's in Galatians 1 and Galatians 5. So they were the legalists. But here, what he's talking about is really the, the libertines. Those, those are the people that are saying, wait a minute, um, you're, you're advocating, let's sin that grace may abound. See, and Paul says, no, I'm not. But see, the libertines are lashing on to that. Let me show you a conversation I had with someone locally a number of years ago. And the person says, Pastor Marcelino, the freedom you're talking about is not true freedom. You're, you're teaching works salvation. I said, well, how do you get that? He says, because as I understand freedom in Christ, it means I'm free to do whatever I want to do whenever I want to do it. And 
your thinking says, I'm not free to do whatever I want to do. Whatever I, want. I said, no, your definition of freedom is a carnal, unbiblical definition of freedom. I said, the biblical freedom is this. You're free to obey God. That has limitations. The difference between me and my friend on the street who goes to some other church is that he feels any type of weight he feels that might make him feel that he has to deny himself, say no to himself, and actually walk with God in holiness and make decisions that glorify God and put his flesh at bay, to him that wasn't freedom. But his definition of freedom was coming from the world, not from the Bible. And let, let me just give you one classic text that shows you that, where I'm right. In 1 Corinthians 7, it's on marriage, the whole chapter. 1 Corinthians 7. Look what it says in verse 39. A wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives. But if her husband dies, she is free to marry anybody she wants. Is that what it says? No. It says she's free to be married to whom she wishes only in the Lord. Now, let me, let me ask you a question. If someone in our church tells me they're in love with someone and they want to get married, want me to do their wedding, and I say, well, who's this person I, you met? Well, well I, I brought this person to church the last couple of weeks. I know you haven't had a chance to meet him, but I, I, want, I want you to meet him. I say, okay, great, wonderful. I look forward to meeting him. And I meet him, and the guy's clearly an unbeliever. And the person who's saying they're in love is with this person who's clearly an unbeliever is, is someone who uh, is a member of our church. What do I do? Well, I go right to this passage. I share the gospel with this person. If I, if I really believe they're clueless on the gospel, and hopefully I'm wrong, but if I'm right, I can endorse that marriage. Why? Look what it says. Free to be married to whom she wishes only in the Lord. I can't, I can't do the wedding. That would be not serving them well. That would not be helping him see his true soul needs. How about this? Go to chapter 9, 1 Corinthians, verse 5. Paul says, do we not have a right, he's an apostle, do we not have a right to take along a believing wife as do the other apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? Here's the question. Put another way, Paul is saying, is he, is, he say, wait, is he saying this? Do we not have a right to get married? Is that what he's saying? What do you think? Is he saying that? No, he's saying, do we not have a right to take along a believing wife? See the difference? You're free to obey the scriptures. All you got to do is read, like I did the other day, Ezra chapter 9, verses 1 through 3, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, and read the whole story where all of those who had been in the exile, they went against the word of God and they married foreigners. It's terrible. Now, We have to grasp here the freedom that he's talking about is crucial. Go to Galatians 5. Galatians 5. Believe me, this is setting the stage. In Galatians 5, verse 1, look what it says. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. And then look at verses 13 and following. For you were called to freedom, brothers, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. So again, the warning, what is the freedom? The freedom is free to obey. People define freedom differently in churches. But what's the Bible say? And this freedom is one in which 
It comes from being justified by faith alone. Whereas the people that say, well, I can sin that grace may abound, or I can, I can marry whomever I want, it's, uh, God knows my heart, and all that kind of stuff is clearly against the Bible. What, it's what, it, what they're really saying is this, justification without new life in your life is acceptable by God. Being justified by faith without your life changing is okay with God. No, it's not. No, it's not. Look at it says in Philippians chapter 3. Philippians 3. Philippians 3, verses 7 to 9. But whatever gain I had, Paul says, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, watch, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. And see, this is a whole other world than what people think. Well, if I just, you know, say I love Jesus and everything's good and you know, don't tell me about holiness and obedience and all that. That's, a, that's, gonna, that's work salvation. That's not, you know, you know, just tell me I've got to love Jesus. Well, you do have to love Jesus. And Jesus said, if you love me, you obey me. John 14, 15. John 15, 14. And so in this section in Romans 6, 7, and 8, Paul is opening up, as it were, the proverbial can of worms and as he dressing, he says, can you be right with God and not have a changed life? In other words, when God's grace comes to a man, does not God implant a new heart with new desires? Answer, class? Of course. So then he goes on, he says, so then shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Answer, may it never be. Look what he says. May it never be. How can we who died to sin still live in it? We can't continue in this lifestyle. Christ is Lord of our life. In Romans 14 Verses 7 and 9. Look, look how Paul describes the believer here. 14, 7 to 9. He says, For none of us lives to himself, and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we <clears throat> live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, that, goal, that point, that goal, Christ died and lived again so that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. John Gill, the great Baptist commentator from the 18th century, said this. What Paul is referring to here when he says, by no means how can he, we who died to sin still live in it? He says, what Paul is saying is this. For a saved soul to live continually in sin would be for him to die again, which is an impossibility. I mean, think about your life. If you're a Christian here this morning, think about your life. When I think about my former life, I, I, I can see that God broke the dominion of sin in my life. He broke it in my life. I hate sin. I, you know, and I can see that, that, that actual point in my life of, of turning from that, and, and how could I go back like a dog <clears throat> to his vomit? How could I go back to that lifestyle? That's what Paul's saying here. He says, <clears throat> Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? No, it's by no means. How can we who died to sin, we're born again, 
How can we who died to sin still live continually in it? We can't. But you can't go back. If you do, you never were saved. 1 John 2, 9, 10. Look what he does. He assumes, he assumes something. 2 Corinthians, Corinthians 3, 18. This is, <clears throat> this is an interesting passage. <clears throat> Because what it really says is what Paul is driving at. It's, it's all about maturity. It's all about sanctification and growth and maturity. If you're here this morning and you really think that reading your Bible and going to church and praying and all that stuff is really, you know, indifferent. It's, it's here or there, no big deal. Well, if you're, a, if you're a real Christian and you neglect these things, you'll be a miserable person after a while. If you're not miserable and troubled, there's something spiritually wrong. When you don't want to worship with God's people, open the Bible and commune with God. Again, I realize people are, we struggle with sin and all that, but the reality is it should alarm you. If, you're, if you really don't miss not reading your Bible for any length of time, you're not saved by a Bible reading, but if you, know, if you really can give or take it, you can go to church or take it and maybe come to church, maybe not. You know, if you serve, serve, maybe not serve. It's no big deal. You're not losing sleep over it. It's just really, you know, it's no big I'm here. I, I wish this preacher would just get over with this sermon. 2 Corinthians 3.18. And we all, with unveiled face, are beholding the glory of the Lord and are being transformed into the same image of Christ from one degree of glory to another, for this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. So in other words, that's called matru maturity, sancti san progressive sanctification. He's growing his people. He's maturing his people. Paul says, in essence, may it then never be. It means impossible. How can we, again, how can we who are alive to God be dead and live dead lives? And then he says here, he says, and I've added this here, it's, it's, it's impossible. A separation has taken place. Sanctification is evidenced by a separation. The separation is spiritual death. Dying to your sin. What happens at conversion is you die to sin. There's a death that takes place. In fact, here's a, here's a verse that you might want to see here. In a verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 24 of 1 Peter. Look how he describes his death. He himself, verse 24, 1 Peter, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. That's why he died, and by his wounds we have been healed. Therefore, the person who has died to sin no longer lives and acts in the realm of sin. We are dead to sin and alive to God. We cannot still live in it. We're in union with Christ. Matthew Poole, a Puritan, said this, it is not our falling into sin that damns a man's soul. But it is, his, it is his living in sin that damns his soul. Does that make sense? It's not his falling into sin. We all sin. We're, we're going to repent of our sins. We're going to fight sin. It's, it's his living in sin that's the damning feature. Not being bothered and troubled when you're not longing for holiness and obedience and serving God and glorifying God, when that is far from you, in fact, it irritates you to even hear it talked about. There should alarm should go off in your head. 
Martin Luther said, we do not yield to our sinful passions and sin, even though sin continues in us. There was a Latin phrase at the time of the Reformation where Luther said this, simul iustus et peccador. It means simultaneously just before God and righteous and a sinner. I'm sorry, just and a sinner. So only can we be, as true Christians, forgiven but yet still be sinners. Right with God, yet sinful. So you shouldn't be shocked when sin happens in your life, but you should see it and hate it and run from it and repent of it and not make excuses for it and determine to so order your private world that you're pursuing and hungering and thirsting after righteousness as a practical outworking of your faith. That's what sanctification is all about. And that's what we'll be looking at very carefully for the next couple months in Romans 6, 3 to the end, chapter 8, verses 39. I want to close with a very hopeful passage. And this is in Romans 8. Romans 8. And he says <clears throat> in verses 28, I mean, verse 29 and following, for those whom he foreknew, pre, pre loved, foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Now, then in verse 38 and 39, same chapter, for I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. May the Lord bless the preaching of his word. Let's pray. Lord, we love you and we thank you that you came to earth to die for a people, to die for sinners who see their sin. And Lord, we thank you for the clear expectation of, of maturity and growth and being transformed into your likeness day in, day out, more and more being made like you. Thank you, Lord, for your great mercy. Thank you, Lord, for the gospel, how it's good news to us. Lord, I pray for, for those who are here today who have not yet trusted you as Lord and Savior. May they see there's great forgiveness for those who see their sin. May they see there's, there's the hope of eternal life for those who see the love that you've shed toward those who repent and believe the gospel. Thank you, Lord, for the joy that's ours to know that you indeed have caused us to be born again and to live for your glory. Help us now, Lord, as we go forward. Help us out of hearts of great thanksgiving, joyfully consecrate our lives to you. In Jesus' name, amen.